Let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your great goodness in giving us this chance to talk about you, and discuss you, and to learn more about you. Help us today not simply learn things about you or facts about you, but help us learn to know you more and more, more closely, to love you more fully, and to follow you more directly. We entrust this time, this conversation to you through the hands of our mother as we say, Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 <laughs> so we're talking about, about Joshua, talking about the fact, the very beginning of his career as leader of Israel, God sends him to conquer people. And the conquering isn't just simply ordinary conquering, it's the destruction of the hands of the different tribes. And how is it that the God who dies for us, who saves us, who says to us, put away your sword, that he hates murder, can send Joshua to conquer in this way. We're comfortable that God commands war in a very um, harsh way. That we know that, that you say, remember, it's not that this is no contradiction, it's a foundation. And the reason why it's a foundation is that we have to keep everything that was being taught to us in the Testament as part of understanding the New Testament. When we're taught the Old Testament, the fact that it says that, and it's not sanctifying the grace, I'm going to add that note. Uh, all it says the rest of the evils. The reason why there's destruction in the Old Testament is because we can't save each other. All we can do by ourselves is limit evil, but not good. All we can do is say, that here's where it ends. Right? I mean, even, even in the book of says that death is a mercy <coughs> ending the period of evil and sin. We can limit evil, we can't forgive it, we can't heal it, can't save it. The reason why now there is a, a difference is not that sin isn't important anymore, sin doesn't cause death, that God's changed. We're now not showing mercy. It's you want to have these attitudes. Now we're applying something new because Christ has come. There can be focus on the land which is sin. I was limiting it to saving people by giving them a chance to repent. Now we pray that from the cross through their conversion and through and helping them forgive and heal. Quite the difference. Now one thing that I didn't add, talked about last time, I should have. Our discussion on sanctifying grace. So we've been talking about. Come on in. Good chair. Maybe we need to move to the other hall. It's great. Um, our discussion on sanctifying grace. He said the sanctifying grace is what saves us and brings us to heaven, makes us to our child. And we lose sanctifying grace by what? More than seven. So I'll talk about this real briefly and then we'll go on back to Joshua. What is more than seven? And why is it that more than seven is still sanctifying grace, which is the share of the sonship of, of Jesus Christ? His union with God, his organization, his sharing by nature, his uh, uh, theosis. What are the new word? What is it? Theosis. Divinization. Divinization. What's filiation? Theosis would have to do with the term. Okay. okay. It's all the same thing. Uh, okay. Gotcha. Theosis. Theosis. Would be becoming like a, this transformation of ordinary human, the old man, into the, into the divine nature. Thank you, Mike. And what is the other word? Affiliation, uh, showing it about my nature, the, showing it the sonship, 
but sanctifying grace covered all of us. So we lose the sanctifying grace the first time in our baptisms. Lose it by mortal sin. Let's talk about mortal sin. If I should have done this last time, I did not. We'll talk real quick here, and then we'll go back to Joshua, I promise. <laughs> Who can tell me the three qualities, the three parts, characteristics of every mortal sin, of any mortal sin be one? It has to be grave matter. Grave matter. Serious. You know it's serious. That's right. Yep. And we're pursuing. Oh, yeah. On purpose. On purpose, yes. Yes. Choose. Yeah, again, you know, words here, serious or grave matter. You have to know, know it's serious, has to be on purpose, deliberate, or we can say full knowledge, full consent, same thing. What makes it be serious? The second thing on the list. The fact that you know that it is, no. I don't know. <laughs> because otherwise, it's sort of the, the same thing. Yeah. That it breaks relationship with God? Great relationship with God, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just like in human relationships, there are certain things we do with each other that don't break our relationship. Now I come to hate Daniel because that today. Might be annoyed at me, but maybe that's different than I beat up your wife. <laughs> yeah. You know, there are certain things that are going to break a relationship other things that won't. And so a serious thing will break the relationship. And what in God's case, either we literally put something before God, or we harm someone in a serious way whom God loves. Or missing the light, they didn't realize. Mm-hmm. That was a different view. Kind of the sun went down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's harming a serious someone God loves, or literally putting something ahead of God, which of course the God can't stand. We have to know that it's a serious thing. We know that it harms God in a serious way, that God in a serious way. Do it on purpose. If it's an accident, or if it's, if it's done without knowing it, if we truly think that something is not serious, I wouldn't have done it. It's not a moral sin. If it's an accident, it's not a moral sin. But it could be serious. Right? So if, for example, I acted that run over someone in my car, is it serious? Yeah. 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 Is it a moral sin? No. It's an accident. If I am told all my life that contraception um, isn't a moral sin, I believe it because I was told it by some priest I trust. Is it serious? Yes. Is it deliberate? Yes. If it's not a moral sin, then they don't even. Now, that's this thing as can't pretend they not know. <laughs> so, we're going to assume in this case someone really didn't know and couldn't. Um, but yes. So mortal sin involves all these three things. And that's why it breaks a relationship with God. It's because we're rejecting it deliberately. We're choosing something that's out of God. And it will only be human by confession. Um, ordinary cases can't go to confession or other things worked out. Okay. Good. Questions on this? Good. Let's get back then to Joshua. And to uh, the conquest of him. city, very, very thick walls. It's the big obstacle to the beginning of it. They're told they're going to conquer the whole land. You have this basically called Jericho. 
and the walls are so thick, people make their houses inside them. Right? People have houses in the walls. So, so at least this wide. <laughs> Probably wide. Right? And so people that actually live within the woods of these walls, literally within the walls themselves. These aren't little tiny like hedges. <laughs> like, these are giant walls. These are very primitive. This is their first chapter. This is their very first thought. Now, up to this point, you know, if you think back and we talk about Moses and the people and every little thing, oh man, look back to Egypt, so let's you know, forget this, it's too much, this is ridiculous, we can't do this, it's impossible. The first time we start seeing trust in God. The first time we start seeing the people willing to follow God, listen to God, obey God, trust in Him, what do you want? The first thing Joshua does is he sends two spies. Go look into the land, look into to the Layer of the other city, look out at what people are doing, look out how can the city be calm? How can we call to the city? Right, it's the very first thing is you have this whole idea where Joshua and the people go, okay, got this great city behind us. Great. They outnumber us, but they're, they're the power in the area. We don't uh, come close to that. Not the number of soldiers, or the number that the, you know, at that, that, that kind of mystery. The great big wall was really deep and strong and fast. You know, unless it's something like the siege works, which is all the time it was back again at that point. Uh, the wall would job. A big enough wall, a big enough people behind it could start a wall. Especially because they were in the desert. Right, the people, it'd be different if they took all this countryside around and take they, they live in and take the of the land. They're in the desert. But Joshua and the people, are, okay, great. Yeah, the city of You have done it. God's told us to go and do this. We're going to do it. Two spies get sent out to reconnoitre the land. While they're there, they stay at the house of Ram, or Rahab. Who is not a virgin of home? It's a part of it. At this point, the king of Jericho knows what's going on. He knows there are Jews in the area, there are Israelites in the area, going to try to conquer his city. He's heard reports now of all the miracles and the prophecies and the, um, the wonders around his work in Egypt and the desert. He's 40 years. And he is terrified. The people are terrified. And they're, they're preparing for a war. Because they say there are powerful gods marching with Israel. And there are these powerful forces where Israel, Israel is going to rule the cult. They're going to defend. Rahab has great faith in God. Even though she's a sinner, even though she is someone, again, who is not an example of virtue, she's an example of faith. And not just simply faith and trust in abstract, but practical in a way. So she goes to the spy because I know who you are. I know exactly who you are. And I am not, moreover, that God is going to put my city into your hands. Imagine that state. You know, you have again this incredibly powerful city, the, the, the power in the world. <coughs> this is the power in the area, because he was still more powerful than technically they were far away. Um, and there are these two men who are spies. 
She could tell exactly who you are. She could turn them over to the king and say, hey, by the way, king, they're in right my house. They paid me for the night. Say, I would own the night. And uh, if you were of them, we'll fight this again. That's it. She says, let me help you in return. Spare me and my family. Make sure that when your God hands over my city to you, you spare us. You save us, you live for us, you don't kill us. She knows what happened. She has faith and trust in the power of God. More so than the right that Jews are going to put on The people who saw the plague, who saw the multiplication, who saw the manna every day. She has faith and trust. And they say, we'll tell you what. If you hide us from the king, find a way to escape, we can go back. Um, and anyone who stays in this house will be saved and spared. Leave the house, throw a fault, they can kill, and they're going to be killed. But if you stay in this house, we will spare this house. And the sign is going to be a cord of red thread. I have a window, and then we'll know which house is yours. A house of despair. And she agrees. Hides on the roof. She, she says, "Wait a couple of days. I'll tell them you escaped and went well down to the wilderness, past the after the booking, and after a couple of days, so let, let you out, let you out, out the window, which is down the wall. You go back to your people and remember your cross." So all you need to trust God to trust these two men. And, and so, so she gathers all her families, her parents, her siblings, her cousins, her children, everybody has the house. What's that? Um, she was just wondering where it was in the Bible. Oh, sorry. It's, it's in Exodus, right? Uh, this is Joshua. 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 Oh, Joshua. Um, <laughs> Siege in Jericho. Yeah, spies in Jericho. So, chapter two. There they are. There's a picture of them in my book. <laughs> Hiding in the hay. Yes, <laughs> Oh yeah. What about she does? She takes off the roof and she spreads out the uh, the reeds over them. Yeah. Flags. Flags. Yeah. Spies say. <laughs> but why a red thread? This coincidence? Does it mean anything to us? Why a red thread? It's like, it would be like the blood that was on the, the door at Passover. Yes. Mm -hmm. Blood at Passover was pointing forward to Christ's cross. So we have, we have the, the, the symbol and the image that the red thread Saves Christ's blood saves. Good for Joshua. Yes. The fifth book of Bible. Oh, I will read part. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So you have here then two the two things to be saved, right? Just belief. But our point is belief in trust, but to action. And Christ Christ. Christ's power, Christ's goodness. Right? These two things are what saves us is our belief, our trust, our, our trust in God, our belief in God, which we live by. And then Christ's love. This is what saves. This is what brings to heaven. And to Ra, he knows the sinner is the one who saved. Because she moved. Right? What's being said to us here by this message, by, by this so far? First of all, we're saved by Christ's blood and by our own belief. But second of all, we're sinners. Christ comes for the sinners. Christ comes for the sinners, trying to save the sinners. If we trust and want his help, if we let him save us, if we, if we allow him to take care of us, this, of course, is Christ's desire. And this very fact that there is this promise of salvation in the midst of, of this ban shows again that God desires not to destroy his people. God's desire is to redeem the people. God's desire is to bring everybody to life. 
There's been a difference in the reaction of the king of Jericho. Rather than saying, you know what, maybe we should find out a way to repent, come back, you know, ask Israel what's going to be saved, they may have a chance to. The reaction is that we reject these people, fight them, you know, we're more powerful than they are. The one who believes and turns to God and so. A big difference. The spies wait for three days, maybe the three days. Three days symbolize what? Holy Gospel. Resurrection of the Christ, salvation, and Luke. They go back and report to Moses, say some, or Joshua, Moses is dead, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then comes the cross of the Jordan. Where Joshua and the people that entered the land as promised land. So, first of all, they're ready. So we can do this, we trust God, we're going to go, and now comes the crossing of the door. And this is a beautiful bookend to the Exodus. But the Exodus, the bringing people to the promised land of slavery, began with, with the miracle of the Red Sea. This mirrors that, bookends that, and completes that. Across the door river. God says, send the priest to go to the covenant. And let them go before the people. And when they step into the Jordan River, let them pause there. They'll part the waters. The people will follow after me on the dry land. And this will be the entered way into the promised land. Now, they could have crossed over anyway. They could have crossed over with ships. They were not chase them. They could have crossed over with, you know, a shallow place for the cross. And I like the Red Sea. This is a little line that's This is simply entering the new life. But God wants for a, a very important sign in your life. A very important small sign and a teacher out of the for us teachers, teaching people. They get to the river, and when their feet touches the water, it says the waters halt and back up a very long way. The waters in the front dry. Because the, the ark of covenant. What's the ark of covenant? Let's start. Let me ask that. <laughs> Indiana Jones, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's the commandments, it's the bad eyes of Aaron's rod. But what, what's the other covenant mean? Following God? Close. Really close. Worship. Worship of God. It's the presence of God? Presence of God. I was going to say, bringing him with you. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Yeah, it's, it's literally this like. This is the visible manifestation of God's presence. Um, the. It wanted to. I should have looked it up. I didn't. Somewhere in scripture it would say. I think it's Hebrews. Um, it describes Christ as a propitiatory, which, which is a mercy seat, um, which is the place of the covenant, with the, that center where the cherubim gathered. Where the Shekinah, the light, God's presence appeared. Um, remember in throughout the desert, those who go go to holy of holies, the holy place, the center of, of the tabernacle, where only the high priest would enter. Where the Ark of the Covenant was, and God appeared this bright this cloudless this cloud and this light, which, which made Moses himself shine upon. And Joshua would go in there and worship and stay with God, God's presence for us all the time. Is, was it the Ark of the Covenant where all the weird colors and angel looking things with the different heads and the different. Is that, was that all part of the Ark of the Covenant? Or what am I thinking? We had the I had like a lion's head and a something else head and it was 
looks like uh, they were flying around above the ark. Right? So, so they're thinking of the vehicles as Ezekiel as well as Revelations. Um, that's, and so that is the throne of God, um, which, uh, which, which, which is the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant is the physical human, I'm saying, yeah. uh, you're thinking of as the vision of the cherub. Okay. Um, which I guess repeated was why the four manuals get the yeah. their That's right. Um But yeah, so it's, yeah, so the, the, but this is a human developer, which becomes the physical presence of God. Which is of course why it becomes a symbol of Jesus Christ, right? This physical presence of God, which we can see, which God is with us, uh, is the mercy seat, the presence of God saved Who goes into the presence of God? Moses. Moses and John. And <laughs> But here God goes among his people. Here God is walking with the people. Here God is walking before them, leading them, being with them. This does the same thing as the pillar of fire. So what's God's desire? Everybody is close to him. God's desire is not to build in this temple where everybody stays far away except for one special person. Where we have to hide from him, or we have to have to can only speak to him. Now, it happens that way because of our sinfulness. It happens that way because we get to understand a couple of things, get our thick skulls before we can understand who he is. All right? The people beg Moses, don't let us speak to God again. It's too scary, it's too much. All those things are The people don't want to be with the people of the fire. People want to be close to God. So God says, "Let me as close to you as possible. We'll all be on the side of the camp. I will side the camp. I will build a, a tent around us. All will invite certain people in a room into the purified But here, God goes from the midst of His people with invitation. You're about to embark upon your journey to the new land. You're about to be with me. You're about to enter to the promised land, salvation, heaven." You go. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to be with you as long as you let. That's never if God is never the one who withdraws. God is never the one who walks away. That's never the one who sends us. God desires to be with us. This is why this is a preparation of the sending of Jesus. This is why this becomes a, a glimpse. What is going to do? Not just simply send a symbolic throne. It's going to send a son. He will walk with us, hide himself, so we can approach him. Come to see the sinner, visit the sinner, visit the sick, touch and heal, and live with us. For the sake of bringing us close to him, so we can go by ourselves. And part of this is the hammer that home in our heads. We can't do this on. We can't go up to the heavens and bring down God. We can't force God to do we want. We're just yes, Lewis, God is not a tame life. We can't tame him and put him in a cage and they perform for us. Sometimes we wouldn't want to do that. Even now, right? You know, we don't want to make God well, I said my hell marries, and I why is that you know, I, I pray you don't be them. Why is that not my goal? Does that go back to that sanctifying grace that man can't save themselves? Only God can save us? Yes. And our acknowledgement of that and acknowledging that and living that is where we'll, we'll be saved and not, you know, right. saying like you're saying, well, we'll do the prayers and you know, this is going to happen. You know? So we have to do the prayer. So we have to uh, do things. So our, 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 because God wants us to work with Him, he made us to be His sons and daughters. So we are involved. But he's one of those everything. He has the last say. He is the last say, but He also is the one who is the source of our grace, 
the, the, the pulses toward himself, the inviter, and the savior. Uh, without God, we can't even begin to come to him. We can't even pray to ask him for his help without God's help. We can't even ask him without him, without him inviting us to ask. But he lets us put in our little two cents. <laughs> <laughs> our little whispering, blathering words. Let's just throw it. Because right. he already knows your mind and heart. So. And he loves us, he wants us. Right? Because all of history, all of history, the whole point of it is what? What's this whole thing about? Bringing us back to God. Bringing us back to God. Inviting us all to be saved. Right? Is God saying to us, I love you, I care about you, I long for you, I want you to be with me forever in heaven? And what's going to keep you from me is this. But God will choices, me, my sins, my sins. Not, 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 not the body. The body is good, by the by God. But my sins. My sins. And so God walks people and he cleanses us. And he's showing us at the very beginning here his power, his protection, and his willingness to live. His willingness to walk with us, to lead us, to be close to us. God didn't have to work this miracle. This is God saying to us, I am still with you. In the same way your ancestor father, who won't die that ever if they rejected him. Rather than that, God didn't say, forget you guys. He's okay. You want to live in the desert? Okay. But he brought them out of Egypt for the miracle of the Red Sea. Now he's bringing the children into the promised land, the miracle of the Jordan. So there again is this cross event. And this said is the renewal. It's not just simply a remembrance, this is a renewal of the covenant. A renewal of God's promises. And the first thing that people do when they get to the other side. Sounds like a chicken man, chicken pop rodeo. <laughs> the first thing they do. Is to read the covenant, read the covenant, come back, you know, and reaffirm in their hearts, desire to God. This is the, those famous words, you'll be in my house, you shall follow the Lord. Joshua says, you guys, this is your chance. You know, God's a jealous God. It's your chance to walk away. You're going to serve the serve. <coughs> By the way, What's the description mean when it says God is a jealous? So what, so what loud is he about him? Yeah. 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 He's about above him. He's not, not going to compromise. He's not going to say, oh, okay, so you have another God beside him. That's okay. I'm cool with it. Because that wouldn't be good for us. It wouldn't be loving for us. We would be rejecting God, which would then lead to our hurt. All too often we have this idea of heaven and hell as this. Those tick box. box take out these boxes and you earn it and get this, you know, like, like, a, like a punch card. Mm -hmm. You know, you get enough points and you get this reward. That's not heaven. It's reunion with God, relationship with God. And hell is the abstract. Either we have a relationship with God or heaven, we reject it, we go to heaven. They renew the promises to God, recognize what the promises in their hearts, and they also then. Um, all the men that have circumcised and circumcised, the spark of their flesh, the symbol of baptism, uh, this physical sign of being united to God, giving themselves to God, body and soul. Okay. The body gets redeemed. So, we have, so at the beginning of the class, Shannon asked me about the resurrection of the body. If the saints in heaven are happy right now, they are, they're in heaven. <laughs> What's the point of the resurrection of the body? Why bother being resurrected? 
It, well, is it really the body that rises with Christ, or is it the spirit? Our, our, our soul, our spirit is basically our being because we're corporal and spiritual, right? Well, so right, right now the saints in heaven, the fact of Our Lady of Jesus, are, are they're only in their souls. There will be a resurrection of the body at the end of the time. Right. Face of the creed. I believe in the resurrection of the body. And, and as Catholics, that's why we believe that we have to be all buried together. I mean, when we die, you can't give like your ashes out to a little bit here, a little bit there, and a, you know, for some people put it in jewelry and all that. But you, you can't do that out of respect. If it happens, it's not God's only go, well, darn it. I was going to raise him the dead, but I guess I can't. <laughs> only part of it's coming now. You know? Shit. <laughs> But isn't that why, as Catholics, that when we're buried, we're buried? It's a, it's a sign of, of reverence and respect. Okay. Sign of and not respect. going out there and spreading out. Right. Yeah. Um, because this, this body was baptized, this body prayed to God, this body received full communion, this body to the sacraments. And so the body is the temple of, of God. Right. And the example we have in the, um, from the Gospels is when Jesus came back, he did come back with wounds. He did come back and yeah, get breakfast. Yeah, because Thomas doubting hands, sticky hands. So something very intrinsic is tied soul and body. I guess it's part of our experience as we move through this life. It's a fully part of us to be body and spirit. So again, so why the resurrection of the body? Uh, why is there this emphasis on the body being redeemed, this part of the flesh? If the saints are in heaven right now and they're happy, and they are. But they don't have their bodies. Does this resurrection of the body matter? Yes. yes. Because we are made in the image of God. Yes. Made the image of God. The body is good. The body is part of us. Let me read you something. First Corinthians chapter fifteen. I'm planning on this, but I think it's important. First Corinthians chapter fifteen. No, this is good because we are confused about this. So I'm going to start um, by First Corinthians 15, 12, 19, and I'll skip the ahead to the six. If Christ is priest is raised from the dead, physically, body. Not just a uh, a spiritual resurrection. And this is why grandma does not become an angel. <laughs> if Christ is priest is raised from the dead, how does our mother say there is the resurrection of the dead, of the body? <coughs> if the resurrection of the body, that is Christ and right. This is how important this is this. It is for this. If Christ has not been raised, but there is a resurrection of the body, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, empty is our preaching, and empty your faith. If that is the case with false witnesses to God, who testify that God raised Christ from the dead, if this is not true, that the dead is not raised. If they are not raised physically, bodily, neither is Christ from the dead. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is vain, you still in your sins. Those who fall asleep are perished. Paul says, this is so important, the resurrection of the body, not just the salvation of the soul. The resurrection of the body is so important, without this, Christianity is false. It's kind of a big deal. Probably <laughs> okay. the center is the trinity. I would say that this is, this is a close, short trinity. <laughs> But, 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 but very important. I, mean, I would say humanly speaking, perhaps. It comes to the human perspective, perhaps. But God knows this out. Um, but, but this is a, a, a really important key, right? But this to say about the resurrection of the body, there's no Christianity, and it's, it's stupid. This is worthless. This is, you know, this, this is a big deal. And it's important we understand this for ourselves as Catholics. 
that we know what it means to be saved in the resurrection of the body. Well, there's a preparation all throughout. For God comes when you were saved by the heals of the body. For God, the body is marked as being saved, as belonging to God. Circumcision. Where when Christ comes under the sail, yeah, I know you're suffering, but don't worry about it, go to heaven. Christ heals, Christ feeds, so why? You also are called to care about the sisters here on earth. God made us. Body and soul. When you love some slow the parts of them, just say, well, you know, I really like left side. <laughs> the right side I don't like at all. <laughs> love that. Okay. Because it says when we go to heaven, we have our heavenly body. There will be no sadness, no illness, and everything. So, what will our body be like? Maybe we'll, 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 we'll,
So the like rocks, yeah. So yeah, so they're but, saying that Adam was firstly of earth, and then secondly was heavenly spiritually. Well, no, it's not. It's talking about Christ, not Adam. Yeah. Well, the heavenly man is Adam, Christ, not Adam. Okay, well, this one here was talking about the first man, Adam. Yeah, that's the first Adam. man, Adam, to become a living being, and, and the, the last second, Adam, given the spirit. Yeah, so the last Adam is Christ. So right. Christ, the new Adam. Um, sorry, I'll go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> but it goes on in Psalm 50 to say, I tell you this, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And, and so we have to recognize there's different uses of the word of the term flesh. <laughs> right? So this, this was back, this was back so the last time. Flesh is different than body? In some context, yes. So the sure. old man, so let me ask that for the first time. <laughs> <before. laughs> <laughs> That's um, that. That's that Baptist Protestant in you. Well, it also is something that has to be the problem we have. If we're trying to describe divine reality between words, yeah, you know, yeah, the candy, yeah. and it kind of works, but also, but also after that, years with different cultures, easily confused. Um, one of my favorite verses in Scripture is from Saint Peter. Uh, it's first, first, first Peter chapter four, I think. Where he says, Paul's hard to understand. What <laughs> <laughs> um, would have happened had I been not sick? Is there would have been a period of 70 or 80 years, 100 years, is from the exact time, of serving God here on earth, working with him, loving him, knowing we perfected, would have been a student body and soul in heaven. So there would have been no death, but the body would have joined the soul, eternal life our way. Uh, what happened though, remember, so the reason, so, so the thing is, this actually does go back to, um, <laughs> our discussion last time of, um, we talked about, I had a second I saw it, anyway. <laughs> don't get up. Uh, the old man, flesh, um, because we inherited Adam and Eve, because they're our first parents, we received the state of our original sin. Now, so, God would have a plan that would have been created, conceived, by being the, the, the children of, of our parents, would have gone sanctifying grace. Would have been conceived in grace and in communion with God. We have inherited Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve lost that. And so now what we have, we have Adam and Eve instead, the state of original sin, whereby we are tempted, where our intellect is dark, our will is weak. Sin is easy. Virtue is hard. I think this is something going on my experience. <laughs> Sin is easy, virtue is hard. This is the old man. When Christ comes, he talks about there being an environment, a new birth, a new beginning. He's talking about sanctifying grace. Which now he has been with God, as friends with God, through who? The cross. The cross. This, so this is the old Adam, the first Adam. This is what he left us. This is his inheritance. And the second Adam is the inheritance of grace, of life, of union. Now, we get to, now, we're, now we're closer to God than it would have been before Adam and Adam. Now we have life and grace and resurrection and eternity. Through God's own Son. Now, the union of the Father through Jesus Christ. Sanctifying grace is a sharing of the sonship of Jesus Christ has with the Father. And so, when Paul, when Paul talks about the first Adam and the second Adam, Jesus, the second Adam, the new Adam, is Jesus. So, to the new man, us now is the life of grace. 
sharing in Christ's life, sharing Christ's word, walking with Christ. I mean, one of these things, it's like, is healed through revelation. This heals us. The will is strengthened through grace and the sacraments, which are the source of grace. Through prayer, it's grace. And now, even though this is hard to do, the reward is greater because we are now the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. We literally are united to God in flesh. Who is coming as a man in flesh. And so what, we, what he does, we will do as well. And this is why Christ when he was incarnate, didn't just become incarnate as a soul. He didn't just appear to be the body. He became a true human being. His body was marked on the eighth day. He shed blood for us. He died on the cross for us. He rose from the dead in the flesh, and therefore we will rise as well. This is why this is really important to Christianity. So without this, there is no Christianity. Because it denies the incarnation, it denies the new man, it denies the kind of thing. So this is why we get the preparation of the very beginning. Right? So, so the, the, the man from heaven is Christ. Right? God became man. He's a heavenly. Because he would never have said, never had that God, never had that, that state of enmity with God. And through grace, the sacraments, the application of the sacraments, we too share in that relationship, that union with God. So what Christ does, we will do as well, as long as we stay alive with him and lose it, by what we By our own choice, rejecting God and following our own desires and passions and sins. As long as we follow Christ, we see the sanctifying grace, we will have as you with God, we will be saved. And the body will follow as well. Questions? Uh, Are we going on to the body with the body will be now? <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> so, one of the confusions yeah. Yeah. Of, that people tend to have nowadays is that we're kind of a hive mind, we go to heaven, this goes along with your idea that grandma's not an angel, or we have our individuality when yes. we get to heaven. It's not that we're just spirit and energy and just part nope. of a grand plan. We don't live in pantheism. We don't believe in being absorbed into God and then we disappear. Uh, because again, that's what we'll be saving you. That'll be consuming you. We, we believe that God came, but this is, this is an incredible thing. And we're spending a lot in prayer. What God made here, God loved and wants to redeem. What God created here, God loves and wants to say. Not just for a day or an hour or 70 years, for eternity. God wants me, which includes this flesh. Be in heaven forever. What we do in the body matters, then. Right. And so, a lot of people are trying to look at the eye, the body matters, take it away with sin. So, the certain one becomes a romantic key to say, well, the, there's no reaction to the body, and therefore, you do the body, you care about it, because the body, becomes, <laughs> the body is bad anyway. The flesh is sin, and so who cares? No. God wants a personal, individual relationship with you and with this flesh. This should be stopped. And how about all the people in Jericho that's going to be eliminated? Well, and so again, uh, so this was back was before the Old Testament. There was the limitation of sin and and, and, and the call to to forgiveness. Right. So once we, we are so stuck in sin, we reject God. Those in Jericho, their death was a final call to repent. They saw it coming, they heard it coming, they knew it was approaching. <clears throat> and if they had that rock out, come back to God, repented, called up for mercy, God would give it. Now, the, the, the death of this family would happen to save their souls, to provide the call out. Right? This is why Christ is first concerned with souls, where the soul goes the body of the fall. Not the other way around. Right? And so the only 
take care of the body and the soul might go down. Because that's what the end of the old You don't ignore the body, you help your brothers and sisters physically, you have to make sure that they're they're fed and, and warm and you know you don't see a child flower with a drink, you don't just say, hey, you just loves and walk on. <laughs> take care of the child. Um, so that's not the first thing. But at the same time, in the other people, the first concern has to be the soul. That's what's happening. In heaven, uh, the body will have several characteristics. Um, so the body will um, not be subject to death or suffering. Can I erase that stuff? Yeah. Okay. yeah. There's two more. Two more. Yeah. 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 No death or suffering. Why? Where did that suffering come from? Sin. 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 And in heaven, there's no sin. We're going to have a living with God. And God's alive. Literally, are living God's life. And when Christ comes and said, I'm sharing with my life, and Charlotte says, the Bible. Eternal, perfect, happy, uh, through, through the grace, saved by grace. Death or suffering, the body um, shines with glory. The body, um, so there's no suffering at the so body's going to be glory. As the body shares, shares it in a physical way. And the goodness of God in, in the um, it displays God. It displays God's life making a human physical way. Right? God is spirit, but the body will display God when Christ displays God. Um, there is the ability to to uh, Pass through walls like Christ did. Um, ability to move rapidly. It sounds like superhero stuff. Um, and why would this be so? Because at the end, this is what is referred to as being a spiritual body. It's not. That's not a real body. It's not that. That it's not um, physical. It's something we're confused about. But it's that. It's so closely joined to the spirit of the Christ, God, that shares its some it, it, it transcends the laws of this physical realm. Also the completely physical. And we see this in Christ. Christ passes through the walls of locked doors. Christ uh, can go from place to place with the little thought. Christ can shine the glory. It's all these things. What are you smoking about? Part of 
this union is because you are united to God. Your intellect, which is with the center part of heaven, as the meat heaven, has to be to vision. The part of the body cycle is on the body. You see God face to face. You know God as He is. You become like God you see God as He is. And this means you will see everything that God knows in God. God knows us individually, separately, perfectly. I believe it was basketball grapes. So only some of the angels have names. The rest of the angels don't need names. But we know them as they are as God knows them. We know them individually. And, and so because we will see God, we can share in His vision, we will know people individually and separately and as we are. Each of us has a unique plan, a unique place, a unique glory, a unique union with God. Because you made us different. You made us as individual people. So he knows every hair on our head. Every hair on our head, and you will know one, the same thing. One, one or two, count mine. <laughs> <laughs> so like someone who's had like a stillborn baby or a miscarriage, they'll know. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Somebody never saw. You know, your great grand right. grandma. Right. You know, um, as far back as we can tell, there's only one Catholic until my parents. And she was a convert in the 19th century, the 1800s. Uh, she converted. Uh, she was the daughter of an atheist who fought the Revolutionary War, who was sent to a convent to protect her while she was there, she converted. Uh, first American born and sister of the United States. Other than that, there's no Catholic in the family. <laughs> as far back as we can be known. Um, but I love her when she was going to heaven. And she'll know me. Um, and so God knows exactly what your perfect body is. I don't. Um, the saints say, now this is taking my soul as you want, it's speculation. But the saints say about 33 years old, that's the age of Christ came. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's all going to be true. Uh, some, some people, um, you know, if a child died, if someone, if they baby died, get, get the, uh, the body of a 33 year old man or woman? Yeah. I don't know. Well, it also says the human mind can't comprehend. So. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so, I kind of suspect that it would be the body for us. It will be your body. Um, now, again, that doesn't mean that if the body gets burned or eaten by wild beasts, that God can resurrect. Well, that's not for hours. Um, even right now, this body is my body. But how many cells right now uh, are still the same cells I had when I was first conceived? Yeah. Not. Does that mean I have a different body now? That you, no, it's still me. You didn't have a different person. I'm six. <laughs> Right? But so over time, you know, we have yeah, we grow our body does change, does grow, does develop, but it's still our same body with this union, individual union with the soul. Same thing will happen in heaven. So it may not be this exact same, but part of that. So we go back to the heal, it will still be your body, it will still be you, still be your, your perfection of who you're supposed to be. Good? Okay. So. That's what I hear. <laughs> the body is for people. I don't care as long as I get there. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, so That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> But it is really important to understand that um, because people despise the body, because people um, reject the body, you know, it is important to understand that the body is important to God. You do have people who, do, who hate the flesh, you misunderstand what's being said about the scriptures, and you say the flesh is important. Uh, they said in the 12th century there was a group called the Algensians. Um, 
back here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you brought us back here. No, you guys did. Your fault. But I do, I do have a question. You called the Albigensians uh, literally would say that the body is evil. And therefore, the body should be destroyed. And therefore, any sins done in the flesh should count. Spiritual sins like pride, they count. Lust and greed and murder, those don't count as sins. So that's the body of the man. How would they believe that? Because it's lust? Mm -hmm. because, because they're picking through scripture. And, and they would say, well, well Christ will really come in the flesh. Um, what the base that is that I mean basically so they based on that some on older philosophy of Manichaeanism, which said there are two gods, God of good and God of evil. The evil God created the body, the good God created the soul. Um, so they, they would say the devil created the soul, body the body, and the body is truly corrupt, the wicked and evil, and our goals get rid of it, and we're gonna be perfect. And remember what time period were these people? These this was the twelve hundred centuries. This is this is why dominant. Uh, started his uh, road to road was to first he tried to try uh, preach them directly and then he said we don't want we need to be married on our side. Right. Okay. Tattoos, piercings. What about it? <laughs> <laughs> is that is that like mortal sins against God because the body is your temple and if we're getting tattoos and we know it if we're getting piercings and we know it so it depends on the piercing and the tattoo it depends on our intention it depends on the subject it depends on the uh, extreme nature of it so is it hurt in the bottom some of them do is it something that is wicked or sinful? Some are, some are. Is it something that is seen or culture scandalous and sinful? Some places, yes, some places, no. Um, for example, in the Middle East, especially in the Muslim, they would put a prostitute on their wrist, which would mark them for death. They would say, for Christians, are going to put this tattoo on their wrist. And therefore, the Muslims of the Christians, they can kill any time. Depending on, on, on the Muslim uh, But they would do that so they could say, it's something I can't take off, can't be removed, and I'm defined. You know, I'm going to Christ, body and soul. That's my moral sense. <laughs> That's an heroic sign of virtue saying I belong to Christ. And, and so it's, it's not necessarily the act of being tattooed or getting a piercing. It's what is your intention behind it? What's being done to the body? Is the body being mutilated or harmed? Are you harming yourself? Um, and what's being depicted and displayed by this? It was being depicted and displayed as God's glory, it's bringing you to Christ, but other around you to Christ, it might be a good thing. It was being depicted as hatred of the body, rejection of, of, of God, and hatred towards sin, it's a bad thing. It was mutilating your body, if it is harming your body, sometimes people just get, get tattooed because they hate themselves. And in our day and age, sometimes people get the pain of a tattoo simply because it's, it, it is a manifestation of pain in their hearts. That's not a good thing. Um, and so I, I don't think it's all the people are evil, all the people are evil, or all they're all good, or okay. It's what's the intention, what's being depicted, is the body being damaged? Is uh, when, when we had to do a, a really good confession. Okay, uh, um, we had to ask for forgiveness for tattoos, you know, so, um, and the tattoo artist that did it, we were asking for forgiveness for him for actually doing it. Well, a lot of tattoos, yeah, especially, again, yeah, kind of culture, right? I mean, these days, we have the ladies that will get tattoos, and I don't, I don't mean anything by it. Fifty years ago, a tattoo was a reject from the body, was a sign of rebellion, and often was deliberately meant, meant to be uh, the mutilation of the body or they were depicting something simple. Now, now everybody has that. You don't think about it the same way. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, because I've heard different things from different priests. So I've got that. That's why I'm saying attention. Southerners tend to tend to lay the ball. Gee, kind of like more sense. Kind of more sense. You know, when it comes to something again, again like this, culture matters. What is modesty? Modesty is control of the body, explain the body in ways that that the person is being shown, not the body parts. What does that mean? Well, time, culture, place. Right? The beach is different than the church. You know, um, some places showing, showing your feet will be really modest. Places it won't be. Depends. Right? Because the body in itself isn't bad. The body is good for How it's used, how it's shown, uh, what's being, being displayed by the action, what's being intended, what is being meant and being depicted is what matters. So if it could be evangelizing through tattoos, then it wouldn't be necessarily a bad thing? Not necessarily, um, but you get to a point where you, where you begin to relate yourself. Um, what I would say is that I personally wouldn't advise it, except in those cases where it is a sign of only Christ um, and a sign of rejection of um, but just because someone had attention to meditation is more than necessary. Okay, knowledge, said all that stuff, all that stuff, and again, yeah, different culture. And okay. live, live in a culture now where yeah, you, you have very sweet little, little kid, eight-year-old girls getting tattoos. It's no longer just the top, but it's no longer the top five you know, gangs who, who that I have to say, you know, get tattoos. You know, now you got the little girls in, uh, you know, going to the Bible camp. Tattoos. <laughs> I don't get it, but it's a different culture. Well, because I know I've had some friends that are gangbangers and they're tattooed up with the Guadalupe and this and that. And, you know, they're not looking at it as it's a rejection of God. It's an acceptance of God, even in the hard times that they're going through in the world. And so again, I might recommend it, but if that's what they're trying to do in their own way, and even if it's a little bit mis if there are better ways to do it, if not trying to lay the body or reject the body or harm themselves, they're trying to obey God and love God. Right. And this is the best way they know how. As a remembrance of it's probably not it's not a moral set. Um, yes, yeah, so the best way, I was going to put better ways, <laughs> but not the worst way. Okay. I don't want to get tattoos after Only if we get a cross. Father said, I'm not going to get tattoos. Well, Father Mike did. <laughs> When I became Catholic, I did. Are you going to hell? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's just because of everything that I had gone through. Unless we have bark on your flesh, why they're saying this is perfect. Yeah. So it'll come off. Yeah. 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 But it's in a place where, you know, I only allow certain people to see it if I want it. Right? Thank you. TMI <laughs> <laughs> there. Not like that. <laughs> But it took a lot for me to become a Catholic. Right. A lot. And, and so this is a way of, of putting it permanently in a mind place we're always going to remember that we're going to come off. So what you're saying to yourself in that case is yeah. being Catholic is going to come off. Right. It's not going to change. No, it's not going to change. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I don't think it's more of a Yeah. Um, follow Jericho. We're getting it. We're getting it. So when we're talking about Jericho, is it the same Jericho that's there today? No. So it was rebuilt um, under one of the kings. Um, I want to. I think it was King Ahab. Um, and the so it's the same area, same name, but it was rebuilt. It was destroyed and then rebuilt. Um, it, it, was, it was a great place for trade. A great place for. Uh, um, it's right on the Silk Road. Follow Jared. What happened to the follow Jared? False. 
happens here is again something beyond human power, something beyond you know the wrong the wrong stuff. We we are the care. And God doesn't say, well, go and get back rounds, go and pull down the walls, the build seat engines. He says, march around and blow a trumpet declaring the war will be done. This for seven days. Number seven, of course, symbolizes what? Perfection, Perfection. and what are other seven? Sacraments. Sacraments. Sacraments, creation, all this stuff on that again. Yeah. Um, seven times on the seventh day, march around seven times, and both the trumpet calling upon God's name, and people shout aloud, the walls will fall. So first of all, you have to have this great trust in God. Where you're, you're told, guys, the wall will fall if you go walk around seven times. Okay. <laughs> Second of all, you have here again God calling the people to Jericho. Again, this isn't an instant thing. <coughs> they see this. They know what God has done. They know what's happening. And they don't look back. Right? They're being called. Plus, they, you know, at the end of the seventh day, they don't go to the, the Rabbah's house. I'm sure they would ask to be joining you, they would fly. <laughs> you know, so God's mercy. And you have here then a, a at the end of the course, you know, the promise comes of his class, the walls fall, and then there are the people fall. Hopefully, so. What you have here is that God fights for his people. God is with us. By the way, what is one of the titles of Jesus Christ? Emmanuel, which means God is with us. That's what it is. He fights for us, he walks for us, he saves us, and he takes care of us. One thing that I would connect this to, by the way, is the Matthew 16. So there's a part in here that I think you missed. So this is the story, I do have connected. This is the story of, of Simon getting his uh, recognition as, as Pope, as Peter. So the, this, is, this is the context is that Christ takes them to Caesarea Philippi, and he asks them who the people say that I am. And this is Matthew 16, 16 to 18, 16 to 19. And I'm going to read you here. And so it's so on your paper, what the context of this Matthew 16 uh, Who's the people say that I am? Uh, they say something about Baptists, the prophets, you know, or this or that. <laughs> Who do you say that? Who do you say that? Forget the people, but about you personally. Simon Peter replied, You are Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar John. Simon said John. For flesh and blood is not real, this to you, but simply that you saw my face. My father was in heaven. Right. Lots of people saw my face. Fairly saw my face. They didn't recognize who I was. It's not simply seeing, you know, my presence, but you knew who I was through your faith. And I tell you, you are Peter. You're a rock. And on this rock I build my church. And the powers of death, literally the gates of hell, not rebel against them. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. One thing that I kind of want to emphasize just briefly very often, we think of the English, the gates of hell are going against the church. <coughs> Often, especially as the culture was crazier and crazier, and even the church goes crazier, the church grew crazier. We get this impression, this idea that we're on the defense, defense <coughs> that we are hedged in on all sides, that things are hopeless, that we are being attacked, that we're going to survive somehow because of this cause. Our gates, offensive or defensive? 
defense. So who is on the rock? The powers of hell. The powers of hell are the ones who are being defeated. The powers of hell are the ones that are being overcome. <coughs> Both of the Jared, right? On the surface, they look more powerful. You know the story. When we say, well, of course, Jericho is going to fall. Of course, Jericho is going to overcome. Of course, Jericho is can't stand and not. Why would you think that? Why would you even imagine that? Jericho falls. These people who think they're so powerful and mighty, they're nothing compared to God. You know this. What Christ is saying here is that hell is on the rock. Hell is on the defense. When God came into the world, he becomes as conqueror as we He comes to win back humanity for heaven. He's carving out his kingdom out of a fallen race and winning back land and people for heaven and for God. Every time someone's baptized, that part of the devil's kingdom is destroyed and conquered. Every time someone goes to confession, that part of Satan's kingdom is conquered and overcome. This is, so, so Christ tied it into forgiveness. A grant is supposed to try and forgive someone from the outset, we the same to be able to forgive sins. Right? So these, this key of the kingdom of heaven are tied to forgiveness and to confession. Whatever you buy, you're actually bound in heaven, but we do such a loose in heaven. This is especially the binding and loosing of sin, getting rid of evil in the world. That the authority of Peter is for the sake of conquering evil, conquering the devil, overcoming sin, forgiving sin, the confessional, the sacraments, the grace, striking the kingdom of God, strengthening God's reign in souls and hearts, in lands, nations, culture, and hearts. And this is an important lesson for us here. Because all too often, especially in this day, we do feel like we're being overcome. We do feel like we're on the defensive. We do feel like we're being attacked, like we're losing. Just like the mansion was some ordinary person seeing this gigantic wall of Jericho. We told our plan is we're going to walk around it. <laughs> and the little fact that fall, trust us. And you do it day after day after day. And you're told, don't worry about it, it's going to be happen. For easier people to say, well, what are we doing here? Why are we doing it this way? Why don't we just go and attack? Why don't we just go and build a seat engine or a battering ram? Why don't we take care of it? Why are we, we why is walking around and going out? Right. See the sacks, why are we relying upon this rather than doing what we know it's going to happen or God's will and because who can do conquers? Us. God in us, with us, through us. The gates of hell cannot be As long as we are with God, let God be with us. See, when Adam and Eve fell, when Adam and Eve sinned, they invited the devil into the world. The devil could conquer the human race. And every one of, the, of their sons and daughters went on. Be created then not in, in friendship with God, but in enmity with God, be God's enemy. And so when God comes to save us, body and soul, he does so winning back a conquered people, liberating conquered people. And the whole point of the Red Sea is to show us that God does. We can't do this on our own. We can't do can't on our own. By ourselves, what we can love evil, we, we can die. We can't save or heal or protect. Once God comes, and there's victory and there's life. Once God comes, Satan's kingdom is overthrown. Once God comes, the gates of hell come away. And what this means then, if that roughly aside, it means that you overcome not by ordinary human beings, but getting rid of sin in your life. I'd be nice to die and pray. And even if by Christ you had to die, 
who end up being persecuted, like the apostles. End up being rejected and mocked, and to the prison, and lose your, your wealth, your home, your family. The gates of power being overcome. Satan's kingdom is fall. And that's something we've lost sight of. Something we forget or are in the midst of. And I say we were the reason for us. When you all when you the only people. <laughs> I wish I could say it wasn't wasn't a we. But we forget this. We have to remember this. But this is the again, everything Old Testament prepares us for what's the New Testament. All of these stories, all of these things of God reminding us, teaching us, showing us who He is, what He's doing for us, how it's that. So, sanctifying grace, union with God, prayer, the sacraments, and Jericho will fall. <clears throat> Jericho is falling. You are. Is that why all the satanic things are just? Out there, like they're building the Church of Satan in New Mexico and I think in New York and stuff like that. And it's it's like becoming right. more and more visible. Like I remember when I was a kid, we Satan's just, time is short. It's his last gas. Gas. I said Mary. <laughs> well, the not us. Look, the opposite. Well, you never know. You know, nothing's impossible, right? Can God save him? No. 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 He's forever gone. It's forever gone uh, because of who he is and what he is. Um, so there is no. It's not impossible for God, but it's impossible for the devil. Because yeah, he already made his choice. He already made his choice, <laughs> whatever happened. Uh, so, yes, God could save the damned and talk about God's power. Uh -huh. Talking about that, about human nature and reality is an impossibility. They will never choose him. They'll never choose him. But it just seems so weird that all this stuff is like in your face now. Sure. It used to be hidden and concealed and now it's just always been there. Yeah, I just say it's, it's always, always been old there. Testament, it's, it's always been there. Now people through. are accepting it more yeah. and more out in the open. Well and, and, and honestly, I do believe that that not to this in the future. There will be open persecution of the Catholic Church now. Whether here in the United States live a true Catholic life, um, might lead to the prison for fines or perhaps death. This is a more reveal that the FBI is targeting the Catholic Church. Yeah. Putting us on terrorist watch lists for being pro lifers. Yep. And at this point, all it is is a watch list. But that was inconceivable 20 years ago. And in a few years, it might be more than watch list. I just, I just can't wrap my brain around that, that and they're actually monitoring. And, and, but what's our goal? <clears throat> our goal is heaven. Let the rats have the same ship. The ship sinks, the rats can keep it. What a great scene. <laughs> <laughs> um, our, our goal is heaven. Our goal is heaven. Let them keep the earth. The earth belongs to the devil, the devil can keep it. Our goal is hell. But also look at what's happened with the road versus way. I mean, there's a lot of things, good things happening to people yeah. of dedication and prayer. Absolutely. So we also have the story ends. Right. Don't forget that. Yeah, you know the end. You know the end. So, Father, I heard that one. What does Bible stand for? What does Bible stand for? B I B L E. What's that? Basic instructions before leaving Earth. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Alright, let's let's close the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for leading us forward in this life. Help us overcome evil. Help us to walk with you always. Help us love you more and more. May all that we say and do be for your glory. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be. 